All right. All right, good afternoon. I am uh, Costa Constantinidis, Chair of the Environmental Protection Committee, and today the hearing will hold a hearing on Intro 1189, a local law in relation to flood mitigation in Southeast Queens, uh, sponsored by uh, Chair Emeritus and good friend from Queens, uh, Donovan Richards. Uh, there is a chronic, long-standing flooding problem in Southeast Queens affecting over 400,000 city residents. The area has more 311 flooding and confirmed sewer backup complaints than any other area of the city in certain neighborhoods, including Rosedale, Springfield Gardens, St. Albans, Jamaica, Queens Village, and the Rockaways, experience recurring flooding conditions. In these neighborhoods, water floods streets, buildings, businesses, and homes. There are a few factors contributing to the extraordinary flooding problem in Southeast Queens. Post-World War II commercial and residential development in Southeast Queens outpaced the extension of the city's sewer system, and many neighborhoods in the area are not equipped with storm sewers or catch basins to manage and drain the precipitation from roadways. In addition to this, the groundwater level in Southeast Queens is relatively close to the, gr to the ground surface and is rising. Prior to 1996, the old Jamaica Water Supply Company pumped millions of gallons of water every day out of the 68 wells to supply drinking water to Southeast Queens. In 1996, this groundwater pumping ended due to high cost association with operating the wells and treating the water to make it potable. The city bought the company and its wells and gradually began shutting them down, transitioning Southeast Queens to, to drinking water from upstate reservoirs. Since the pumping ended, the groundwater level has significantly risen. According to reports, in 2012, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, DEC, temporarily pumped groundwater from Station 24 in Jamaica, which provided some relief to flooding in the area. But this pumping ceased and the flooding problems continued. In April of 2015, Mayor uh, de Blasio's administration released one, uh, one NYC, the plan for a strong and just New York City, which is the city's comprehensive sustainability plan. The plan includes an initiative to alleviate flooding in Southeast Queens, According to NYC, the city's plan to alleviate flooding in Southeast Queens will consist of intensive and accelerated long-term sewer build-out, uh, complemented with innovative site-specific solutions, such as blue belts and green infrastructure. In March 2016, during a preliminary budget hearing held by this committee, DEP officials testified to the, to, that the department planned to spend $1.5 billion on measures to reduce flooding in Southeast Queens by pairing traditional sewer construction with green infrastructure throughout the region. It was very much welcomed. And thank you, Council Member. Uh, a big kudos goes to Council Member uh, Richards for making uh, that uh, happen. Uh, Southeast Queens communities have struggled with flooding and sewer backups in homes and businesses for decades with little relief. The mayor's plan is intended to, and hopefully will, finally bring some relief to these flood-burdened communities. Now let's hear from Councilmember Richards on his legislation, and then we look forward to hearing from the administration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I just want to say you must have some psychic abilities because you plant this hearing on a perfect day. <laughs> when a norice is coming and winds are going to be high, you just could not write this script. And uh, I want to thank you for your leadership, uh, and more importantly, not forgetting about Southeast Queens, and it's, I know my constituents are deeply appreciative of, of your leadership and, and your, the work you've done around climate change and in particular our community. I'm here today as the prime sponsor of Intro 1198 and, a, and as a representative of Laurelton, Rosedale, Springfield Gardens, and the Rockaways. Uh, today it is an honor to have legislation that would directly impact uh, our communities. Uh, for decades, residents of Southeast Queens have lived with the fact that a slight rain could end, end in their home being flooded. But in 2015, a historic 10-year plan by Mayor de Blasio uh, committed $1.5 billion, well, closer to $1.7 billion, to build out a sewer system that never caught up with the population growth in the area. Don't ask me why homes were built in the first place without infrastructure being put in, but that's another story for another day. Year after year, homeowners have been forced to swallow flood, flooded lawns, streets, and basements because proper drainage was never built for our communities. Administration after administration ignored their pleas for help. Thankfully, this administration answered the call and came up with a real solution. Now, no plan will provide immediate solutions for decades of systematic neglect, 
but several projects in the plan have already been completed and many more are in the process. And I want to thank you. I know Twin Ponds is finishing up now. We're moving to Hook Creek Boulevard. That is why we are here today. This bill will ensure that the plan is implemented in a timely fashion and the community can be updated on the progress on a regular basis. I've held several meetings in my district with the Department of Environmental Protection. I want to thank uh, the commissioner and, and, all, and Eric and all those who are involved uh, every day uh, with listening and coming out and actually hitting the ground. And I know Karen is not here today as well, and I want to give her a special thanks for really being responsive to our community. Having a publicly available plan with a specific timeline for implementation and annual performance milestones will allow the city to be more transparent with its residents and allow homeowners to check their status whenever they like, rather than waiting for us to arrange a meeting or hand through the grapevine that something is coming down the pipeline. I'd like to send a special thank you to former DEP Commissioner Emily Lloyd, who took this issue seriously, rolled up her sleeves and spearheaded this huge undertaking. And of course, thank you to Mayor Bill de Blasio for delivering this victory to Southeast Queens, as well as my colleagues, Council Members Miller, Ulrich, and Wills, who introduced this legislation along with me and the Chairman. I'd like to also thank Samara Swanson and Bill Murray, the heart and soul of this great committee, and my Legislative Director, Jordan Gibbons. And of course, we're joined by a few uh, community people who really have, we would not have gotten to this point, although I get credit for this. It was really uh, their shoulders I stand on. I know we're jo joined by Bill Scarborough today, uh, Andrea Scarborough, I see Spring Jam, uh, Kim Lawton and her crew here, uh, the community board, and I want to thank all of them for really uh, fighting many years uh, to get to this point, and we look forward to more progress as we move forward. So with that being said, I'll turn it back over to our chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Richards, and, and thank you for your continued leadership. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Eric Landau and, and DEP. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Costantinides, members of the committee. Uh, I am Eric Landau, Deputy Commissioner of Public Affairs and Communication at the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Um, with me uh, this afternoon is Angela DeLillo, Director of Capital Program Management in our Bureau of Water and Sewer Operations. We're also joined uh, today by Deputy Commissioner Eric McFarlane, uh, as well as other members of DEP and uh, DDC. Eric is Deputy Commissioner um, at the Department of Design and Construction. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on mitigation of flooding in Southeast Queens and Introduction 1198. As the committee well knows, and as you both acknowledged in your opening remarks, for many decades, the commercial and residential development of Southeast Queens outpaced the build out of critical support infrastructure, including catch basins and storm sewers. As a result, Many parts of the neighborhood suffer chronic roadway flooding and ponding during rainstorms. In 2015, Mayor de Blasio announced the 1NYC plan, which among others included the goal to reduce the risks of flooding in the most affected communities. As part of the <coughs> FY16 10-year capital budget, Mayor de Blasio allocated $1.5 billion specifically to address flooding in Southeast Queens, which has been subsequently increased to a total of $1.7 billion. Last month, DEP Acting Commissioner Vincent Sapienza joined Councilmember Richards to provide an update to local community residents and civic association leaders on our comprehensive plan, which includes a significant amount of green infrastructure, blue belts, trunk sewers, and early action sewer connections. In addition, the department continues to engage the community on steps that members of the public can also take to mitigate flooding and better protect their property. As the committee knows, green infrastructure uses a natural technique to detain, retain, and absorb rainwater before it becomes a flooding problem in the street or on someone's property. The most notable type of green infrastructure is a curbside rain garden, commonly known as a bioswale, which looks like an enlarged and densely planted tree pit, but is designed with specific plant species known to soak up a significant amount of water and is engineered below grade to retain and infiltrate stormwater. Rain gardens intercept stormwater coming down the street, preventing it from going into the sewer system. In addition, they provide other hugely important environmental benefits, including improved air quality and greening of the street. DEP is proud to be partnering with the Department of Transportation, the Parks Department, the School Construction Authority, NYCHA, and DDC on green infrastructure in Southeast Queens. We estimate that this work will result in the build out of 200 curbside rain gardens as well as other green infrastructure investments at four city parks, two public schools, and two NYCHA developments. 
In addition, we're building blue belts to help manage stormwater at Springfield Lake, Baisley Pond, Twin Ponds, and Brookville Triangle. The bulk of the current funding, over $900 million, will go towards the construction of large trunk sewer spines on 150th Street, Guy Brewer Boulevard, Farmers Boulevard, and Springfield Boulevard. This work will take place through 18 separate projects, the first breaking ground as early as next year. These projects will install and replace over 16 miles of storm sewers, five miles of combined sewers, seven miles of sanitary sewers, and 21 miles of water mains. In addition, over $500 million of current funding is dedicated to what we refer to as early action sewers. Early action sewers comprise neighborhood sewer construction projects as well as short sewer extension projects, both of, both of which will provide relief. Please note that we've broken ground on some of these projects already with more to begin construction this year and next. Um, and members, we've uh, provided a map um, of community boards 12 and 13, what we commonly refer to as the Southeast Queens plan that shows um, where this work is taking place. It also shows how we've done the analysis by breaking up Southeast Queens into uh, a number of grids and prioritizing those into the 50 um, uh, most uh, needed to be addressed grids, uh, primarily based on complaints that we received over a five year period. In addition to the new infrastructure, DEP has been working closely with elected officials, community boards, civic associations, and local schools to discuss specific ways that homeowners can help alleviate flooding conditions. Attached to my testimony today for each of you is a copy of our homeowner's guide to rain event preparedness, which includes six specific things that property owners can consider. For example, check valves, softening their property, or clearing nearby catch basins. In addition, we've done extensive outreach and education both in public schools and door to door in over 50,000 homes in Southeast Queens about the proper disposal of grease, which is by far the leading cause of confirmed sewer backups across the city. We've provided all of you with some of the examples of the grease materials that we distribute broadly uh, to homes and communities um, around the city. Turning now to the specifics of intro 1198, which requires DEP to publicly publish our plan to address chronic flooding conditions in Southeast Queens, what we commonly call the Southeast Queens Plan, and to report on our progress annually. While we do not object to the requirements and this legislation is currently drafted, we have a couple of key points simply for the committee's awareness. <clears throat> First, it's worth mentioning that DEP reports on this and all capital work regularly. Even prior to the announcement of the $1.7 billion in funding, we've been meeting regularly with all Southeast Queens elected officials and community boards 12 and 13 to provide an update on the plan and our progress. In addition, we regularly provide community briefings, similar to the one Acting Commissioner Sapienza provided last month to community leaders. DEP, as well as DDC, which oversees the design and construction of this work, submits progress information through the Mayor's Management Report and both report on projects at the Borough Budget Consultations, as well as Borough Board and Community District Service Cabinet meetings. Finally, we report annually on the progress of all of our capital work in both our preliminary budget testimony in March and our executive budget testimony in May. Second, this legislation currently includes Community District 14 in the reporting requirements. While we are very aware of the flooding conditions in Community District 14, often made more severe by the low-lying nature of the Rockaways and Broad Channel, the Southeast Queens plan and the associated $1.7 billion in funding has been specific to Community Boards 12 and 13. Now, all of this is not to say that Community District 14 does not need capital infrastructure investment, nor is it to say that DEP is not doing work there. In fact, included in our 10-year capital budget is another $188 million for sewer projects, specifically in Community District 14. We just want to continue to be clear that these projects are separate from what we commonly refer to as the Southeast Queens Plan and its associated funding. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My colleagues and I, of course, would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I have a few questions before I turn it over to uh, Councilmember Richards. I want to recognize that we have two uh, members uh, of the committee here, uh, both from Queens, Councilmember Lanceman and Ulrich. Uh, first question I have is, is DEP confident that the total cost of the Southeast Queens sewer build-out and flood reduction plan will remain at 1.6, 1.7 billion? 
so, Councilman, I, I think it's always uh, it's always been fair to say that uh, this funding is sort of the initial funding that will be required to fully build out mm -hmm. all of the infrastructure that's needed in Southeast Queens. This is a massive step towards the inevitable goal, but um, but yes, I think it's fair to say that there would need to be more funding to come um, many years from now, but that yes, this funding is an unprecedented huge first step towards that. And as we move forward, we'll be able to at least count on this funding and no less moving forward, correct? Yes, correct. Um, so what is what percentage has already been completed and will be completed by the end of this year? And what do we anticipate being done by the end of 2021 um, as we look to the future um, and sort of looking at uh, administrations changing and so on? How do, how do we sort of game out the next five years? Sure. Um, so uh, for example, with the with the trunk sewer projects that we talked about, um, which on the on the map are, I'm sorry, I can't <laughs> I can't see the map from exactly where I'm sitting. Thank you. So on the on the trunk sewer projects, which are on um, Guy Brewer, um, uh, Springfield, 150th Street, and I'm having a hard time seeing it. And on Farmers Boulevard. There are 18 uh, projects that make up these trunk sewers, which are the trunk sewers are the really, really big sewers. 12 of those 18 projects are currently at DDC um, in various stages of the process. Um, some of them are expected to begin construction as early as 2018, um, some uh, in 19, 20, 21, 22, um, and even a couple that are uh, currently expected uh, 23 and 25, but tw again, 12 of the 18 are already at DDC. Okay, and by 2021, how do we? Uh, so there is one currently uh, on Farmers Boulevard that's expected in construction in 2021, uh, and all of these will continue. This is sort of a rolling process, right? As, as we continue to move down the design work of each of these, working with DDC, more of those dates will become um, more identified, but I, what I think is is key about this piece of legislation, and what I think is the point of the legislation, Councilman Richards, not to presume all of your intention, but what I think is the, the point of this legislation is to get to your exact point, is that year in, year out, to know the exact progress mm -hmm. and the status of all of these pro projects that we will be formally announcing as part of the plan as required by this bill. I just want to make, uh, is there any concern about future administrations not continuing this, this, uh, this plan, and how do we sort of put this in a lockbox to make sure that we can continue that. So I believe the capital budget has has done so by putting it in a lockbox and, and again by taking that unprecedented step of allocating $1.7 billion to address a long-standing product. So this is, a, this is a, an issue that, is, as you said, a long-standing issue for the residents of Southeast Queens that uh, uh, people in our, in our job come and go, but we have to make sure the work gets done for the people. That's the ultimate goal, right? I agree 100%. So making sure that that funding is there in the long term is always uh, and unable to be touched as we go from, in, through changes, whatever changes those are, whenever they do happen to occur. Right, so it's making sure that's the case. And with that, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Richards. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I think, um, so I'm sure you saw the Daily News article this morning. I mean, you could not beat this time timing. Um, on 147th Avenue, a young lady by the name of Clara Smith, who's sort of been dealing with this. And, and, and I think, I, I, we get it. We understand that <coughs> there's just no infrastructure over there. Um, so the question is, um, so how much uh, of the sewer build out do you anticipate to be completed uh, this fiscal year and next fiscal year? Um, and I understand <coughs> that we just got this money rolling and things have to go through design, so I, but I'm just interested in knowing so how many projects. So there were a couple of standalone contracts that we were able to get started on because they were already in the pipeline but unfunded. And once we were able to get the funding in place, we could move forward. I'm going to call it from a later point in the process. Mm -hmm. um, the other can you, And can you speak to the projects? The projects the themselves. The particular projects? Do, Do we have a list of? We, uh, we can get those. Which ones are the ones that we've already broken ground? Or Glen Oaks, uh, 183rd Street, 119th Avenue. Um, yeah, and uh, we have South Jamaica area. These have received notices to proceed by this date. 
uh, 208th Street. Um, if it's helpful, Councilman, we're happy. Yeah, to, we're just to, yeah, to don't don't worry because yeah, I, I, mean, I, I understand that's DDC's map yeah. and I've seen it and it's. I I, I, I would if I if I if I could just take a moment to you you made reference to this morning's Daily News article. Um, this morning's Daily News article, we were expecting that when the reporter called us, it was, he talked about sewer backups specifically, and so we've spent a lot of time trying to explain sewer backups and that the majority of sewer backups, over 70% of them citywide, are the result of people pouring grease down their sink, which Councilman, you and I have had long-standing conversations about, and how we try to work very closely with property owners to spread the word about proper disposal of grease. And in fact, this year, in addition to normally working with NYCHA developments, community boards, we went door to door on over 50,000 homes within Southeast Queens, providing information that, that you have in front of you, as well as some um, in the kitchen reminders um, about that. Yeah, and, I, and I'm familiar with that, and I have a law, obviously, that sort of curbed that on businesses. But what I am interested in, in, and especially because Councilmember Williams and myself did pass a bill that requires catch basins and sewers to be cleaned out, so mm -hmm. I'm sort of a little perturbed on how she called so many times. And, but I don't know the specifics of it, but I'm interested in hearing a little sure. bit more. Sure. So the, the, the first thing I'll mention is, uh, so your bill um, obviously requires that all 150,000 catch basins be inspected annually. Um, that is a significant change from the three-year programmatic uh, inspection cycle we were previously on. Um, we have every expectation and full confidence that by the end of this fiscal year, which is the first year that uh, that, that local law has been in effect, we have every confidence mm -hmm. that we will hit that 100,000, that excuse me, 100 percent goal um, of all 150,000 cash. And I will inspected. say that I have seen your trucks out definitely doing it. Thank you. More frequently, so I won't argue. Um, that. So we we have every expectation mm -hmm. um, of of meeting that goal. Um, the other thing that I would mention and related to the specific issue is raised in the article is that um, they're not that specific location is not a catch basin. It's a seepage basin. Mm -hmm. um, and as you yep. know, but for the benefit of, of mm -hmm. others, seepage basins work somewhat different than catch yep. basins, mm -hmm. is that seepage basins are placed in locations that don't have a sewer pipe to connect to. Mm -hmm. And so it retains water in the ground, depending on the type of material in the ground, sand, clay, what have you, soil determines the level in which that water absorbs and the speed in which that water absorbs. And so it is possible that seepage basins can take upwards of 48 hours to fully absorb all the water as opposed to a catch basin where it's going to work much faster. Again, seepage ba basins were an innovative solution to locations that did not have the same level of infrastructure. So let me highlight just a few for us. So I believe this area is the Brookville Triangle area. When do we anticipate this project to begin? I'll name three projects. So that project, I know we're joined by Spring Jam today. They had, um, I'm interested in knowing if the 150th Street is a connection to 157th Street, which I believe it is. Um, and then uh, lastly, Auburn, uh, Thursby Avenue, which I think is slated for 2021, which I'm not too happy about, and I think we should have more discussions about that particular site. Um, all right, while we wait for him to get those particular things together, um, so you mentioned green infrastructure and bioswells. Um, so 200 uh, bioswells being installed across Southeast Queens. Um, when do we anticipate this process and these projects to begin. Mm -hmm. I'm also interested in knowing about maintenance of our green infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, what is your job strategy on green infrastructure? I would love to see local Southeast Queens people mm -hmm. uh, actually working on green infrastructure jobs. And if mm -hmm. we're gonna do 200 bio swells, interested in knowing what's your hiring strategy, outreach strategy to make sure residents have access <coughs> to these jobs. So, um, the, the right-of-way bioswales are currently in design, um, and uh, we uh, hope to go be going into construction uh, in them, I believe, this fiscal. Okay. Uh, but th those are currently in design. Um, in terms of the maintenance um, and the hiring, because I see those questions related, um, the, the maintenance plan is the DEP will be maintaining all green infrastructure um, with in-house staff. We are adding new positions to maintain all of our green infrastructure, as well as any fa DEP facility that has a landscaped area. For example, some of our wastewater treatment plants have landscaped areas around them. And so this in-house um, in -house team will maintain not just all of the bioswales, but any place where we have landscape needs 
And we um, recently, recently reached out um, just a, a few weeks ago to your staff as well as your colleague staff to let you know that we are about to have a, um, a, a, a day of interviewing for about 40 new green infrastructure positions. Um, we anticipate getting a lot of applicants as these are entry level um, positions for the maintenance season. Um, uh, but we have 40 positions that we will be having a screening day um, in February. Uh, and uh, we had reached out to your staff to let them know that so that they could send the job link to people in the community. Anyone that, the only people that will be, get, that will be invited to the screening day will be those that have applied through the, the online um, process. We'll be happy to re-forward you that information if it's helpful. If you can just get to the project, and then my last question before I'm sure my colleagues have uh, questions is, um, so on strategy, on outreach, will all of this information uh, related to this bill be online? Will, will the public have access to search it publicly? And I know DDC has a website. Um, it's not updated properly. I mean, I go in and I look to um, uh, look at projects that are in the pipeline, and I don't think they, they maintain their website to the greatest degree um, as well. Um, so I think that's it. So I'll just, the so, three projects that I mentioned. So I've got two of them right here. The third one I'm going to have to get back to you if that's okay. Um, but so Rosedale uh, project, uh, estimated cost is $40 million. Uh, project uh, construction anticipated to start in 2018. Fiscal 2018 uh, October or? October of 2018. October of 2018. Is the current estimated start date. And Brookville Triangle, which is a $60 million project, is estimated to start in September of 2018. And I'm going to have to get back to you on Arburn, but we, I know we've had some conversations with Arburn as it relates to all of the work that needs to happen there, not just DEP, and happy to continue that conversation with you. Okay, so I'm just going to... Uh, circle back and say that, um, you know, these three areas are areas that were hit h hard by Sandy. Um, the, forget Sandy, they, they still overwhelmingly flood even prior to Sandy. So I want to make sure that we're not pushing back. So if we say September 2018, 2018 we need to really be clear and, and that should be a definitive date. And I'm really not going to want to hear that it's going to move to 2019, 2020. So just making sure that we keep that clear. I also just want to weigh in on, um, obviously, groundwater. And, and let's not forget about uh, the conversation. I know we're joined by the Scarboroughs, and they'll definitely touch on that today. Um, but we should still be studying and looking to ensure that we're looking at an overall bigger picture of pumping again and ensuring that groundwater, obviously, is dealt with as well so you know obviously and I and thank you for that obviously groundwater is a is a complicated topic as you very very well know um, as the State Department of Environmental Conservation is responsible for uh, permitting any sort of use of, of, of groundwater or pumping groundwater the city of New York has not used groundwater in its drinking system for many years um, however, we do have a permit with the State Department of Environmental Conservation. That permit is coming to a close, um, but we will be applying for a new permit so that the wells that we have in Queens, um, if the need ever arose where we were ever in any sort of emergency where we needed to start using that water again, we would be issue going for that permit again. Um, we, though, is not often um, the case and is certainly not required by the state. Um, DEP has agreed to do an environmental review of the, the pumping of the Queens groundwater wells. Um, the timeline on that environmental review for your information is that we plan to issue the draft scope of that environmental review this February with uh, public hearings on that draft scope in late March um, or early April uh, with a final scope in June of 2017 to be followed by a draft um, environmental review in October of 17 hearings on that draft EIS in December, January, December, January 17, 18, um, with a final um, environmental review to be issued in March 2018. Additionally, um, because groundwater is such a complicated area and it's clearly not a city-only issue as, as it relates to the state, as I know you know, mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, we have been in conversations with others. Um, there is a, a conversation that's taking place right now um, over what is known as radial collection um, and a series of pipes that would, as I understand it, lead into, um, into Baisley Pond, collecting mm -hmm. that groundwater leading into Baisley Pond. Uh, we believe that that is a, a very, very um, interesting um, proposal and do agree that it needs to, be needs to be studied and are supportive of that study. Alrighty, um, I think just the last thing I think I raised was would all this information be publicly accessible? So that's online. my understanding of the point of the bill. Okay, got it. So I just want to make sure. Okay, got it. Okay, so I, I didn't hear you mention that part in the bill, but that's okay. But you're supporting that. Okay. Alrighty, I think that's it for now. All right. Um, quickly, before I pass it along to my colleagues, I saw that uh, DOT, DDC, there'll be another number of city agencies coordinating about who, who is going to be sort of leading the charge here. Will it be DEP? Um, how do we make, how do we see this coordination working and making sure that we're, we're constantly in lockstep? Uh, so thank you. That's a, that's a great question. And, um, and it's a good point that, uh, so DEP is sometimes the answer to the solution. Um, sometimes it is a, it's a, a pipe that needs to be put in the ground. Sometimes it is a street condition, whether it's a, a road surface or a regrade. Sometimes it is both a pipe and a road surface regrade issue together. Sometimes it is things that, um, that we need the property owners to help us with. Um, so all of that needs to be closely coordinated and we have regular meetings with, uh, with our partners in government, with DDC, to make sure that that coordination is happening and that we are in lockstep, as you So we'll make sure that, that there's no you know, permit that we're waiting for from some other agency to get the work done that needs to happen. That's correct. All right, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Council Mayor Ulrich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, Commissioner, for your testimony um, and um, for your office's follow-up on several local issues. Uh, related to my district. I'm glad that we're actually talking about uh, flooding in Southeast Queens and that we are mentioning uh, not only the Rockways, but I saw Broad Channel was also mentioned in your uh, testimony. I have a few uh, questions. Um, the first one is regarding the sewer uh, and waste treatment plant in the Rockaways. I know at a previous hearing a couple of months ago, I had the chance to ask you and Commissioner Sapienza about the potential upgrade there. Was it going to be upgraded to a pumping station or was it going to be, you know, upgraded to a full, I suppose, treatment waste facility? Um, and that was uh, still up in the air. Do you remember a couple of months ago we had uh, that? Yes, I remember, the, I remember the question, but I, I'm not sure that there's been anything new on it since then, so I'll happily follow up with you okay. on that. Okay. Do you know when a decision might be made? Regarding, and the reason why I bring that up is because the stench, you know, the, 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 the smell when you drive down Beach Channel Drive past a Scholars Academy, past Beach Channel High School. It's definitely not as bad as it used to be. I know when Matt Mahoney was working for uh, DEP, we drove him absolutely insane about this issue, and there were a number of things. The poor guy, he's, I don't know, I don't know how poor he is, probably making a lot of money in Long Island now, but uh, great friend. and. Uh, I know that they s invested some money into that facility trying to mitigate the smell and some of the other issues uh, that exist there, but um, I know that we have a capital plan. I know we're talking about investing millions of dollars into infrastructure projects to improve you know, the processing of uh, wastewater and treating that water before it's discharged, but I'm, I'm still curious to know what is the grand scheme for Rockaway? I want to know, what's, is that included in the capital plan? Yeah, so, uh, so I want to get you the most up-to-date, accurate information on that. So let me circle back with Commissioner Sapienza and, uh, and follow up with you directly. Uh, also, I'm concerned about uh, the rain that's going to occur tonight. I know we're, we're um, predicting that we're going to experience a severe weather event. And there are two locations in my district that I think um, need immediate attention. The first is Cross Bay Boulevard driving north between Broad Channel and Howard Beach on the right-hand side. Um, there is massive flooding. I don't know if it's a catch basin that's been filled with cement or what, is, what has actually happened there, but it is a chronic flooding location. And what bothers me is that at nighttime, when you can't see because of the lack of street lighting, you know, there are a number of accidents that occur because cars that are in the right lane, there are only two lanes driving north between Broad Channel and Howard Beach. If you don't see it, and you slide into that massive puddle, you know, you could crash into a tree, and that has happened uh, on many occasions. And I don't know why DEP hasn't 
uh, taken corrective action there, but I'm hoping that maybe you can send a crew down there or maybe take a look at it. Um, the other location is actually also driving northbound on Cross Bay. As you get over the North Channel Bridge or the Adabo Bridge on the right-hand side, there's an enormous amount of trash that goes into the catch basin that is adjacent to Vitro or Vetro, uh, restaurant, catering hall, whatever you want to call it, and uh, that also creates uh, flooding conditions at that intersection. And this is an emergency evacuation route. Cross Bay Boulevard is the only way in and out of the peninsula for people that have to evacuate uh, that aren't going towards Long Island or aren't going over the uh, Marine Parkway Bridge. So we want to make sure that it's clear, uh, especially during a severe weather event. And uh, those two locations are also um, a big concern for me and my constituents. So Thank you, Councilman. Um, so I will uh, absolutely flag both of these locations for our, our operations unit and ask them to go take a look uh, today. Um, you should also know that in advance of the, the rainstorm that we're all anticipating yesterday, um, uh, New York City Office of Emergency Management activated the Emergency Action Plan. So DEP, working with our partners in government, OEM, DOT, and others, went out and checked flood-prone location areas to check, take a look at catch basins, clear them of any debris. Obviously, that will help mitigate any ponding or flooding um, as much as possible. We've also sent out information, certainly to all electeds and community boards, as well as um, posted on various social media um, about the weather prediction, asking uh, people to not only if they see something on top of a catch basin to, to clear it, but also if they see a ponding or a flooding location, to call it into 311, calls to 311, go directly to our operating bureau um, so that they can prioritize and send a crew out um, as needed and appropriate. Uh, the, uh, lastly, if I can, um, in Lindenwood, you know, we experienced uh, several uh, severe flooding events, even when the weather wasn't even that severe. Yeah. Uh, that was related to the malfunction of the Spring Creek uh, facility, a malfunction that took place in Brooklyn, actually. I just want to make sure that there's someone there to manually operate that in the event that tonight, you know, the, the sewer system is overloaded. Yeah. I don't need hundreds of, of, of homes in Lindenwood to get flooded again. I'm just hoping that you have a plan to... So, uh, so following the off. unfortunate event in April 2014, where we did have a malfunction at the Spring Creek CSO facility, um, we have uh, since that time, and it, when we've had major rainstorms, we have had ha we have had extra staff um, on at the Spring Creek CSO facility to ensure that such a thing doesn't happen again. So tonight, uh, you know, there will be somebody at Spring Creek, or well, more than somebody, I hope. Uh, I, I will certainly confirm that, but that has been my my standing understanding. We should have a conversation offline with uh, DDC at some point um, because I think part of the uh, reason that that occurs, in addition to the, the uh, CSO issue at the Spring Creek facility, is uh, the aging infrastructure that exists on the Brooklyn Queens border, City Line or you know, Sapphire Street, 75th Street. I know there's a capital project, HWK. It's, uh, it's been in the works, I forget the number exactly, for a number of years. The community board has been uh, working on this. We, we're actually very grateful that HWQ 411B in Ozone Park in Centerville is now underway, and that's happening, that's wonderful. But there's an HWK project uh, that's sort of been on a shelf for a number of years that would s uh, provide a significant upgrade to the sewer and water uh, infrastructure on the Brooklyn-Queens border. I think it starts in Brooklyn and continues into Lindenwood and Queens. And we'd like to see that in motion. I know Commissioner Lloyd was very supportive when she was uh, in charge, and I know that Commissioner Sapienza is probably just as enthusiastically behind it, but I know there's a lot of federal projects that are funded, and it takes you know, studies and you know, years to get through, but um, this would mitigate a lot of flooding on the Brooklyn-Queens border. And if you look at all the development that's taken place, especially on the Brooklyn side uh, with the um, the mall at Erskine Street and all the wonderful affordable housing that's been put there. I mean, there's a lot of concrete going in the ground there and not enough seepage. And I think that uh, we need to upgrade the infrastructure for the residents of East New York and Canarsie, but also for my district in, um, in Queens. And if the funding is there, we should move that along. So I'd appreciate your help with that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Chairman, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your indulgence and for your testimony. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, last question uh, before I let you go. Um, so will there be anybody in particular who you have assigned? I know you're working directly, but is there a point person who specifically is working on the Southeast Queens plan uh, and DEP? Who's the point, who's the point person? 
Who are we gonna call? <laughs> well, you can you can always call me in my office, Councilman. Certainly. All right. We'll so you're the person. Answer. You have all the knowledge. Uh, so you I, don't mind me bothering you or, and other people. <laughs> You just can always call us, absolutely. I, and you are good at that. Thank so, you. All right, so you're the point person. Uh, yes, sure. <laughs> are you the point person? I am not the person overseeing the construction of it, no, okay. but, but I can certainly always get you the information you need. Okay, and I'll just say, um, just state for the record that, yes, Southeast Queens, the Rockaways, we still want to see the Rockaways, you know, more definitely a little bit more outreach on projects sure. out there. And I know you've been open to definitely doing uh, more to do community, a, a meetings community meetings out, out there, there, there with the commissioner. Um, so definitely we should do that to Absolutely. update the community out there as well. Happy to. All righty. With that being said, yeah, we could do a joint. Eric and I will do a joint meeting and you can come and present all the good work you're doing. You let us know where and when. We'll be there. All righty. YMCA. We'll pick a date. Great. Um, all righty. We'll get into testimony now. Thank you so much Thank you. Uh, Thank you. for your testimony and support for, of the bill. Thank you. All right. First panel, William Scarborough, Adelaide's Park Civic Association. Andrea Scarborough, Veronica Hicks, uh, Spring Jam Block Association. Uh, yeah. And Kim Lawton, Spring. I guess, no, keep them on one panel. Who else do we have? Do we have the spring jam? Ernest Flowers can come up on this panel. We'll put them all in one. Fluid. Um, so we'll do Andrea, Ernest, William, the hot seat. Then this will be the next panel? Yeah, that'll be the next panel. Yes, that's still good, yeah. I had a little flood up here, by the way. That's fine. It's just the water. Okay. Water's never hurt anybody. Uh, Mr. Chair. They don't know. All righty. So we're going to do Andrea Scarborough, William Scarborough, Ernest Flowers, if they're here. All right. Ernest had to leave. Okay, gotcha. Andrea uh, has testimony. Uh, we made the mistake of trying to drive over here, and parking was horrendous. Oh, <laughs> yes. So she is sitting down in the car. Okay, so no problem. No problem. Uh, I'll I'll ask, we had somebody from the okay. Hold on one second. We I'm had sorry. somebody from the Inge Environmental Justice Alliance. All right, you come on up. So we'll do you, and then last panel will be Spring Jam. Should I read her testimony? Also yes, sir. Okay. You're going to read it into the record, yeah, and then yeah, okay. we'll ask you a few questions, and then all right. Um, let me start. Wait, let me swear in. Okay. And Tamara's going to sway you okay. in first. Oh, okay. Somebody else should be at the table. Yes. New York City Environmental Justice uh, Alliance. Pamela Su Sufo? So Soto. Okay, got it. All righty. All right, so you state your name for the record. Yeah. Well, She's going to swear you in, and you state your okay. name for the record, who you're representing. Then you may begin. Please raise your right hands. <coughs> you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Should I go ahead? Okay. Um, I'm going to read my testimony first and then the testimony of Andrea Scarborough, if that's okay. Okay, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman, Council Members. Uh, my name is William Scarborough, you know, today representing Addisley Park Civic Organization, but I'm also the former Assemblyman for the 29th Assembly District in Queens, uh, which includes Jamaica, St. Albans, and other parts of Southeast Queens. First, let me state my strong support for intro. 1198 and the work that Councilman Richards has done to make sure that those efforts stay on track. I think that that's tremendous and, and necessary. Uh, for many years, I have seen firsthand evidence of the damage done by flooding in Southeast Queens, both to homes and businesses in our community. I want to begin by commending the Department of Environmental Protection and especially our council members who represent Southeast Queens for the progress they have made in recent years in combating flooding in our community. Through the efforts, especially of uh, Councilmember Richards, but also Councilmember Miller and Wills, DEP has committed $1.5 billion over a number of years to build the storm sewer infrastructure that is sorely needed in parts of Southeast Queens. This is the largest infusion, infusion of flood mitigation funds to our community in my memory and is long overdue. The significance of this commitment cannot be overstated and will be a tremendous benefit in relieving the stormwater flooding on our streets. However, as many Southeast Queens residents know, flood damage in our area is the result of two basic issues. One is the street flooding that is being addressed by this new infrastructure. 
and the second is the high water table that exists underground. This simply means that the standing water level is so close to the surface that water is constantly seeping into basements and lower level offices through floors and walls, whether it is raining or not. <coughs> this new infrastructure does not address this issue, which has damaged countless, countless homes, businesses, and institutions in Southeast Queens. Private homes, as well as York College, Allen Senior Houses, the Carter Houses, IS-8, and the Parsons Archer Subway Station are forced to run electric pumps 24 hours a day due to this problem. As DEP admitted in a recent meeting, we understand that the issue of groundwater flooding is a difficult one. I would like to ask this body to consider, consider supporting a proposal called Radio Collection, which was just met, mentioned uh, by Deputy Commissioner Landau, and uh, which has been proposed by Douglas Greeley, a former DEP Deputy Commissioner. This would recreate the system of underground streams that existed in our era, area prior to overdevelopment. These streams ran into larger bodies of water, such as Baisley Lake and perhaps Springfield Lake. I don't know if that's still in the latest iteration of the proposal it was at uh, the beginning. But uh, these large bodies have outlets that run directly into Jamaica Bay. And if restored, they could carry excess groundwater into the bay. Um, I guess the easiest way to try to give people a picture of it, and it's a uh, vast simplification, but if you could look at this as a, a person's hand, and the fingers of the hand extend out into the areas where there's high water, and the fingers, the water would then be drawn through the fingers into the palm, which would be like Baisley Lake, which already has an outlet going to Jamaica Bay. So the high water would run into the uh, lake and then out to Jamaica Bay. Uh, I would mention also that in the past, uh, the environmental advocates of Jamaica Bay have welcomed this because it provides a fresher uh, type of water as opposed to what's going in there at the present time. <coughs> I'd say also, uh, Commissioner Greeley, in his layout, has uh, done maps of where these streams uh, previously existed and overlaid that with where the complaints of the most groundwater intrusion currently exists. And there's a correlation between where those uh, lakes used to exist, which are now dammed up, and where we're getting the most complaints about groundwater intrusion. So there's a correlation there. Uh, Commissioner Greeley's plan has the potential for mitigating this persistent problem, and he has proposed a study to test the feasibility of the plan. This would have to be a joint city-state project and the state representative for the 29th Assembly District has requested $300,000 from the governor to fund the study. Uh, DEP representatives have also seen Commissioner Greeley's presentation and have expressed support, and I believe that they have agreed to pledge $100,000 towards that study. Uh, there are many issues that need to be addressed in this study, but it offers promise and does not require pumping of the Jamaica water supply wells, which has become a, polit a political problem. If this study proves fruitful, we will need this body and especially our Southeast Queens representatives to put forth the same dynamic effort that has yielded such progress so far to develop a truly com comprehensive plan to cover all aspects of the Southeast, Southeast Queens flooding problem. The projected cost of the build out of this project is $20 million. Thank you for your consideration and your continued efforts on behalf of our community, William Scarborough. Thank you, uh, Mr. Scarborough, for your uh, testimony and the work that you've done uh, on this issue. We'll come back for questions. I'm going to let her finish her testimony. Okay. And I want to acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Miller. I also have Andrea, but let her go on now. Oh, okay, go ahead. Read you're, through hers okay. quick, and then, right. we'll, quick and then we'll. Uh, okay. Um, in relation to flood mitigation in Southeast Queens, good afternoon, committee members. I'm Andrea Scarborough, president of the Ashley Park Civic Organization. Our civic serves the Addisley Park residents of Southeast Queens. We are committed to improving the quality of life for all of our neighbors and ensuring that our community receives its fair share of city services. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify regarding intro 1198 in relation to flood mitigation in Southeast Queens. Addisley Park Civic Organization supports the City Council's legislation intro 1198 law, which calls for the Department of Environmental Protection to submit to the mayor and the speaker of the council and to make publicly available online a plan for mitigating flooding in the Queens districts of 12, 13, and 14. 
Surface water and groundwater flooding have been a long-standing issue in those districts, and while there, there have been tremendous gains by the City Council and the mayoral administration to address this chronic condition that exists in Southeast Queens, a comprehensive pro proposal is required with a timeline to resolve those long-standing issues. I applaud and acknowledge the $1.52 billion awarded to our community to deal with improving our infrastructure, which will provide storm sewers in areas where they're sorely needed. However, finding a solution to groundwater flooding and a high water table is of equal importance in these districts. The closing of Station Well 24, which resides in my neighborhood, has resulted in some of my neighbors pumping water out of their basements 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There are residents in Southeast Queens who cannot sell their homes because their homes have lost resale value due to groundwater flooding. Therefore, it is our view that groundwater flooding created by a high water table must be included as a part of the Southeast Queens flood mitigation plan. A plan separate from surface water flooding and one that out outlines a timeline for implementation, annual performance milestones, and appropriated funding. In conclusion, intro 1198 is a step in the right direction towards resolving the chronic condition of flooding in our community. However, without addressing the high water table, a flood mitigation plan remains incomplete and puts at risk the opportunity to have a high functioning sewer system in our community. In the words of former Commissioner Emily Lloyd in a testimony hearing before the City Council in, two for, in 20, 2007 stated, as uh, Commissioner Emily Lloyd stated, as the groundwater table rises, it infiltrates our sewers, reducing capacity and flooding some basements of buildings in the area. Council members, APCO thanks you for the introduction of this legislation, and I urge you to include groundwater flooding in your mitigation plan. Andrea Scarborough, President, Addison Park Civic Organization. Thank you, Ms. Scarborough, for your work as well. All right, now we'll begin. Sure. Um, and before you begin, I'm just a little upset with DEP for bringing plastic bags into the house of the city council. Uh, in the future, we want to see reusable, reusable bags, bags or we're going to charge you five cents, all right? <laughs> and we don't mean taxpayers, all right? So we want to see reusable bags. Eric, if you hear this, all right, you may begin. Good afternoon, members of the City Council. I'm here to testify in support of this intro on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Founded in 1991, NINJA is a nonprofit citywide membership network linking grassroots organizations from low income neighborhoods and communities of color in their struggle for environmental justice. NINJA empowers its member organizations to advocate for improved environmental conditions and against inequitable environmental burdens. Through these efforts, our member organizations coalesce around specific common issues that threaten the ability of, of low-income communities of color to thrive <coughs> and coordinate campaigns designed to inform city and state environmental policies. For too long, Southeast Queens has had to deal with inadequate stormwater and sewer infrastructure. As documented in 1NYC, the City Sustainability Plan, this area of the city has had more 311 flooding and confirmed sewer backup complaints than any other and experiences recurring flooding during rain events. We commend DEP for committing $1.5 billion to accelerate relief in Southeast Queens by building out the sewer system to support population growth, as well as implementing site-specific solutions such as green infrastructure and blue belts. We support this bill, which would bring greater transparency and accountability to DEP's plan by making it publicly available online and requiring annual progress reports. Um, this will ensure that the plan is implemented in a timely fashion and allow the community to stay updated on progress. This proposal is not dissimilar from the existing New York City Green Infrastructure Plan and the corresponding annual reports, but because Southeast Queens is not one of the priority watersheds designated by DEP, this flood mitigation plan is not concluded, included in those reports. NIJA has long advocated for sustainable and resilient stormwater management in environmental justice communities. In 2010, NIJA launched the Waterfront Justice Project, New York City's first citywide community resiliency campaign. NIJA discovered that the significant maritime and industrial areas are all in hurricane storm surge zones and that the city had not yet analyzed the cumulative contamination exposure risks associated with the clusters of heavy industrial uses in such vulnerable locations. Through the Waterfront Justice Project, NIJA has worked to mitigate the threat of potential toxic exposure faced by low-income communities and communities of color in and around the SMAAs. 
Our New York City climate justice agenda is a multi-year research and advocacy campaign to address the need for a comprehensive community-based approach to climate adaptation and community resiliency. In 2016, we released a report which analyzed de Blasio's 1NYC plan and made several concrete recommendations to strengthen the city's climate adaptation and resiliency policies in environmental justice communities. We cited this flood mitigation plan for Southeast Queens as a good model for other flood prone neighborhoods of the city, specifically recommending that similar steps be taken for the city's significant maritime and industrial areas. Green infrastructure in particular provides many co-benefits that help alleviate the disproportionate burdens faced by environmental justice communities by improving water and air quality, providing more green space, building climate resiliency, and mitigating the urban heat island effect. Nija would like to thank the New York City Council Committee on Environmental Protection for holding a hearing on this bill, creating an opportunity for public comment on this important measure for greater accountability. We urge the passage of intro 1198 and look forward to continued collaboration with the city on this regard. Oh, well, thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Uh, just a quick question. So uh, in your opinion, has the city uh, done a better job at communicating um, with your organizations uh, around flood mitigation and around plans to, to advocacy address uh, this issue? And I think you sort of did go into, which would have been my second question, what could make this plan better? Mm -hmm. um, so if you just want to highlight that once again, yeah, well, uh, I, I would absolutely, again, uh, commend DEP uh, for uh, their responsiveness in recent years, and especially for this infusion of funds, which, uh, again, is the largest that I've seen. We've been involved in this for many years, and I cannot uh, help but uh, commend my representatives uh, because you guys have gotten this done, and, and you've really worked for the community. Um, again, uh, my view is that we need a comprehensive plan. Uh, as uh, good as this is, it still leaves the one area of groundwater flooding and groundwater intrusion. And I believe that the plan that uh, Commissioner Greeley has put forward uh, could be a tremendous benefit in uh, relieving this and kind of bring the plan into a comprehensiveness. And it has the benefit uh, as uh, the councilmen know, of not having to pump the wells because that has become a political football between Nassau and, and Queens and so on. So I, I would just urge your support for that and uh, just continue to hold everybody's feet to the fire and let's get this done. And that's a cheaper alternative too than yeah. to pumping too. So right. you're saying basically right. your guesstimate is around $20 million. Around 20. That, that's uh, commission Which would really be a, more of a drop in the yeah, bucket. That's I mean, compared the commissioner's to guesstimate, have. not mine. Okay, commissioner's guesstimate. Yeah. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's even better, but I'm happy to hear DEP is at least having right. the discussion, and mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's probably cheaper to do that. Just hearing from you, and I want to thank Eddie Bautista, <laughs> and, and certainly you for the work you've been doing uh, on this for years as well, so just interested in hearing uh, from you as well. Yeah, um, I think that, um, to your question, it's definitely trended in that direction of greater accountability, but this is an important measure to ensure that that continues and that is, it's strengthened. Councilmember Miller, I know you like to have some questions. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So good afternoon. to see you both. Uh, Assemblymember, it's great to see you down here uh, once again. And, and, and myself and I know Councilman Richards are, are just uh, honored and privileged to really pick up the ball and, and attempt to carry it over the line for all the work that you've done I over the you decades. Saying that, and you did. And, it. and it's just, <laughs> it's. Uh, uh, we, we, we could not do it without the work that you, you yourself and your organization as well as uh, your organization and team has done. So um, around this legislation here in terms of uh, uh, reporting and, and, and transparency, um, have we found that that has been the case uh, up until now that information is being disseminated about the projects that are being done um, and better, more mm -hmm. frequently? more accessible? Well, let, let me just uh, say by way of example, uh, years back when the plan was to uh, discuss pumping the wells and so on, and there was a plan with a timeline uh, back at that time. And we did not find out, actually there was a pilot program 
where pumping was being done. And we in the community and elected officials did not find out until about uh, a year and a half, two years after the pilot program had been discontinued uh, by virtue of a, uh, a hearing or, or a committee that we were having in the community that it was mentioned that this work had been discontinued. And so we're going back 2010, 2011. And so I think that just shows the lack of communication that was being given to the community at that time. And that's why I think it is so important that you have this kind of timeline where they have to come back every year, every six months to report on what's going on. Mm -hmm. So these things don't uh, fall through the cracks. So uh, while, while I, I do agree, I think that as you mentioned in your testimony that we have not seen this magnitude of work being done by the DEP anywhere ever. Mm -hmm. And so um, we have not seen the need for reporting that we now see. Um, I just recently received some, I, I would like to say rather disturbing information about one of the projects that were being done and the project was underway, that is the 183rd Street, uh, and you, you're very much familiar with that, mm -hmm. between Hillside and, and Jamaica there. Right. And that the project had begun and um, it wasn't, the, uh, the infrastructure wasn't adequate. So um, the project has to, had to be halted and rebid it. Mm. And um, that information I didn't get from the DEP. So I would find that disturbing. While there's much to applaud, there's much work um, obviously to be done. And, and so is there um, something that can be included in terms of human capital to ensure that we have the oversight of to, to, to uh, undertake these massive projects that we're seeing now? How do we ensure that even this intro is it, it does what we expect it to do? Well, uh, in my view, I don't think anything uh, can replace the kind of oversight that you as our representatives are putting forward. I mean, just the fact that you stay on it and that those agencies that are charged with implementing these plans know that you're going to be there and you're not going to um, you know, kind of let it fall by the wayside, I think is the best protection that we have. Um, I, I, I uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, obviously as I was upstairs in the contract committee hearing, which, I, which was equally important, um, and so most of my questions were for the admin, and certainly that will be forward in addition to mm -hmm. questions to Absolutely. them. Absolutely. And, and certainly um, we have some uh, questions that we'd like for you to forward. And just know that we, I will, my office, will work, continue to work in conjunction with yours and collaborating with uh, Council Member Richards to make sure that this legislation comes to fruition, that there's the oversight that we need. And certainly, uh, more importantly, working with the advocates to make sure that the, um, that the, uh, the there's a, a, an additional groundwater plan that, that is attached to this, because certainly um, we know that while this is great, that there is a persistent problem that exists um, that is very costly to Southeast Queens, whether it's your college, whether it is uh, some of the schools and not just the homeowners, uh, that has to be addressed and is ongoing. And to, to for us, we, we'd be negligent if we <coughs> merely address this problem and did not address the groundwater spill. And as if, well as if I can just add uh, one other point for consideration, there's a tremendous amount of economic development going on in downtown Jamaica, uh, tremendous uh, uh, investment by the city and the state and well-deserved, but this groundwater adds to the cost mm -hmm. of that construction because when you build there, you then have to take into account that you're building in soft ground as opposed to solid ground. So, I mean, there's an economic reason uh, to get this resolved as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to testify. Absolutely. Thank you, Catherine Miller. And I want to thank you uh, for your uh, long advocacy on this issue. I remember uh, being in the DEP offices in my previous life as a staff member for Jim Gennaro. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, uh, Jim, working, Jim was, was very helpful. Very helpful. Uh, so working on this issue for a long time with you both. And, and thank you for your strong advocacy and looking forward to working with you. And of course, with the, the, the fine advocates that we have in Southeast Queens and elected officials and Councilmember Richards and, and Miller as well with you. Thank you. But thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we have uh, Ms. Kim Lawton from the Spring Jam Block Association. Uh, Veronica Hicks as well, and Louise uh, Torbert. If you can all step forward and be sworn.
have a fifty. I have twenty copies, but it's at home. Oh, okay. All right, that's all right. Yeah. Come on. Spring Jam Box Association. Spring Jam. Spring Jam Box Association. Good afternoon. Um, can you have a seat, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, can you please raise your right hand? Yes. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Please, thank we have you. testimony. Yes. Can the there you go. Okay, I want to make sure everyone's at the table. There you go. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes. Please begin as you're ready. Yes, hi. Good afternoon, um, Chairman. Um, my name is Kim Lawton. Um, I'm the president of Spring Jam Block Association. Um, I have to my left my sec uh, our secretary, um, Veronica Hicks, and our treasurer, Louise Torbert. Um, they always joke around and call me the mouthpiece, so that's why, <laughs> so that's why they're pushing me to the table. But um, actually, um, all three of us have worked very hard um, many years to uh, be able to come here today to testify on behalf of this bill, so I appreciate it. I'm usually an impromptu speaker. That's the reason why I left my copies. But um, I will read what I wrote. Um, dear Chair, Committee Member, Councilman Richards, and to all the community homeowners, tenants, and effectuated parties of the flooding in Southeast Queens, I stand before you, actually I sit before you, as President of Spring Jam Block Association with our executive board members and other members of the association in support of this bill in relation to the flooding. More importantly, I stand before you as a homeowner and a resident of 159th Street of Rockaway Boulevard in South Conduit, who with the members of the community have suffered through flooded basements, ponding on 157th Street, and a fear of, be, of the flooding um, destroying our neighborhoods. Um, if you don't mind, I'd just like to speak because I feel more comfortable um, than reading. Um, our organization was actually created as a result of the flooding in Southeast Queens. Um, prior to Hurricane um, Sandy, we had Hurricane Irene. And our basements were flooded to our knees in water, feces, and garbage. Um, we didn't know how to really go about addressing this issue, so we went on New York One News, and we basically said to uh, Senator Sanders, who was a councilman at that time, um, we don't live in Garden City, but we deserve to have a certain quality of life as well. Um, we called him out on the news, and Councilman Richards was the chief of staff at that time, and we wanted to know where they were, and from that point on, they have not lost, left our side. Yelling does that. Yeah, <laughs> and going on the news. <laughs> Um, we organized ourselves. Um, we are um, in an area that is the best kept secret, but it also uh, um, is like the lesser of two evils. We're off of South Conduit um, between 156 and 159th Street. We're actually in the area that's so fortunate to be a part of the JFK IBID, which was recently um, approved into legislation. But um, we're also a mixed use neighborhood with businesses and homes. Um, when we went to different conferences or different meetings regarding this project, we were told that we had the highest 311 calls in the neighborhood. We have ponding, our basements are flooded, our quality of life has been destroyed. So we are very, very, very happy that this bill is coming into fruition. And um, basically, that's you know what my letter is saying is that um, this is long overdue. Um, I think that the sewer systems, when they were created, they didn't have the extensive development or, or the extensive development that took place in Queens in mind. So not only is this um, in terms of the homeowners uh, uh, resolving flooding that would improve our quality of life, as uh, Mr. Scarborough says, there are a lot of economic benefits and a lot of economic pitfalls. So um, I ask that you approve this 
Um, and thank you so much for your time. And I think any everything else that is pertinent has already been said. Thank you. I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Donna, uh, Councilmember Donovan Richards. Are there any other testimony from the panel? Come on, Louise. Yeah, yeah, please come. We don't have to be fancy. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I brought my home back in um, 2001. Um, it should be red. Look. Is yeah, it it's red. Oh, it's red. Okay, got it. Okay. I guess I have to get closer. Um, I brought my home back in 2001, and um, from 2001 to um, August of uh, 2008, my home was flooded six times with um, sewer water backing up into the home. And like my um, president said, we just we just got tired in 2011. That's when we had four feet of water in our basement. And um, we just got tired and we just got fed up and that's when we decided to go on the news. A lot of the homeowners in, the, in our neighborhood, um, what they have done with their driveways, it's basically put up walls, put up, even before I left my home today, I put out my sandbags because I don't know what I'm gonna come home to. So when you're at work and, and you feel uncomfortable when there's a rainstorm because you don't know what you're gonna come home to after working a 10 hour day, um, it becomes um, uh, frustrating and upsetting. But um, you know, I'd like to say thank you to our Councilman Richards who has been by our side. He supported us 110%. And he's, anytime we reach out to him, he, he's always, always supportive. And I'd like to say thank you for that. So I'm looking forward to um, moving forward with this, this project and um, hopefully we finally, me and my neighbors, we finally get some relief from the water. Ditto to what they said. <laughs> Nothing to add. We're going to repeat the same things. We all had the same problems at the same time. I don't know whether this is the proper time to ask you, but we. Just, just a mic. We got to keep it to the mic. You're on TV. <laughs> okay. The proper time. We talked earlier about the uh, infrastructure starting to. So it's 157th Street project. Is that going to start this year, 2017? Well, I think we have to check. I think you're in design. and de So before you can put sewers in, design has to happen. So I believe they're in that process with you. You're within that 12 to 18 projects. And then we should see that. And I wish we got them. Can you speak to that, sir, or no? No? OK. So um, but you can assure that you know we're watching. And, and you were mentioned very early on in this process. Um, so they should be close to finishing up design, as they said, out of the 12 to 18 projects slated, they're in design, which is, let's be clear, this has been years in the work. Um, and, yes. and for, I, I'm being clear, for you to even be in there already is a victory in itself because it normally takes, as we've seen with some of these <coughs> projects, just to get it to design has taken decades, right? Um, so you can rest assured that we'll be watching and making sure, and this is why this bill uh, is, is very important because it, it adds a level of accountability. So no matter what administration's in place, whether Commissioner Lloyd leaves or whether new Commissioner Lee, whatever commissioner comes and goes, this is the law and they'll have to by law report on it. So it's one way to make sure that you're up to date on progress and you can feel at ease more so because even, I mean, we're politicians, right? Sometimes you hear us and you're like, ah, oh, well, there's that question mark. Okay, he said it, but you've been heard this song before, right? But I think that this eases it. It makes my life easier in one sense because when you question me, you can now go online and literally see that this is happening. Um, so I think that this bill is going to help to ease that as they, as they update it and we pass this into law, and I look forward to doing that very soon. Um, and you'll be invited to the bill signing again if you wish to take off work in the Nor'easter again. I will. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll be here. <laughs> um, so I want to thank you, and I think you're there. There, what you've done is amazing. It's and, it, and forget the news. The news doesn't pressure me because it's about doing the right thing. And I think that if more communities get engaged with their local official, you know, know we're here because we didn't know you existed before this. We didn't know about the flooding. Um, <laughs> Right, and you didn't know we existed, but I think that this is an important story. It's very important to get engaged, and not only to get engaged, but to organize yourselves. Organize, communities being organized makes things and moves things a thousand percent faster yes. than it would be going just as one. Not to say one voice is not important, but 
uh, community organizations are important. So I applaud you in starting an organization. And uh, we just passed a law, which they were here, the mayor signed into law, the JFK IBID, um, which is amazing. So I want to thank you for coming here in this weather. Uh, and you can rest assured we'll be ensuring that everything we say we're going to do, we're going to continue to do. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much, Councilman. Thank, thank you. you all for your testimony. Appreciate thank all your you. strong advocacy. And I know that uh, Councilman Richards every day is fighting very hard for, for his communities. He's the best. <laughs> He's the best. Yes, we are. Thank you. He's the best. Any more testimony? All right. Seeing all right. Oh, can I just close out? Just want to acknowledge we've been joining. She marched in D.C. Uh, we were in D.C. Saturday at the Women's March. Uh, and I don't want to thank you and, and I want to thank DEP for not giving alternative news today um, <laughs> but I want to thank you for definitely uh, coming out today and, and I know you're tired probably because we marched and marched and marched and uh, thank you for the work you're doing in Rosedale uh, to better the quality of life. Jackie Campbell Rosedale Blocks Association she on my back <laughs> all right <laughs> Thank you, Councilman Richards, and thank you for your strong, strong advocacy, and thank you all for being involved um, in making sure your community and fighting so hard and holding us accountable. And that's what this bill is going to do, is, as Councilman Richard talked about, it's going to add that level of accountability. So again, I want to thank the mayor's office for this commitment, and we're going to hold them to it. And uh, we look forward to moving this legislation as it's a high priority for this committee. Uh, so I want to thank our uh, members of our staff, uh, count, uh, our attorney, uh, Samara Swanston, uh, who always does great work, uh, Bill Murray, our poly analyst, uh, Jonathan Selter, our, our financial analyst, uh, my staff, uh, 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 Nick Wazowski back there, and, and John Benjamin, and as well, all the staff of Councilman Richards, who I know work so diligently every day on this bill. So with that, I will gavel close the Committee of the Environmental Protection for today. Mm -hmm.